Well, I've got a question actually. This one probably could be answered by either Doug or Ben. Um, Mark, you can also answer if you want to, but uh, this wasn't really covered in your talk. Um, you two guys mentioned about um, uh, expanding a uh, scientific method, perhaps, or, or procedure to uh, allow first person insight or some other expanded uh, input from maybe enlightened people or people with first person perspectives. Um, uh, how, how do you propose that we, we do that? Well, I've met some really smart people, even some people I would consider geniuses, but uh, they, they're, not, they're not allowed to speak in the scientific community. They're basically silenced. Um, how can we uh, allow them to have a voice? And how can we distinguish between people who may be smart, really, really smart, so smart that people uh, in mainstream science may not understand them, and those that are just completely bonkers? Yeah, the, the first thing I would say regarding the kind of examples you mentioned is that this sort of, of social dynamic of people who are, are brilliant but eccentric and may think differently being sort of cast out of the, the in-group, this is not specific to science and certainly can be found in the history of religion and, and spiritual pursuit uh, very frequently, both in ancient and, and modern times. So I'm not... I'm, I'm not sure that's e exactly the same question. I, I, I do think that if, uh, if either science or religion were operating perfectly, that wouldn't happen, and there would be more of, a, of an attitude of, of openness to, to new ideas, even if they cause people to question their, their assumptions. And people seem not to be good at that, generically speaking, although... Of course, some people are, and some groups are, at, at, at some times. More generally, in terms of, of practical steps toward making something that goes beyond the current scientific method, while incorporating many of the strengths of the current scientific <coughs> method, I, I do think consciousness studies would be a good place to start, in the sense that it's something clearly where contemporary science sort of runs into a dead end and where traditions not normally considered as science have made some headway although they also they also haven't understood everything so you could you could imagine a consciousness research institute somewhere consisting of a bunch of scientists who are doing empirical measurement work on consciousness theoretical work into the science of consciousness, and were also engaged in practically exploring different states of their own body and, and mind, and tried to bring these different things together. Now, things like that have been tried multiple times in the past, and haven't really ended up being at the forefront of, of scientific consciousness research, which suggests that it's not an easy thing to do. But I, I guess that's the sort of direction you'd have to go in. But as I said in my talk, I'm, I'm a bit dubious of how much prospect human beings will make on this in our current form, which is where you get into the fact that I'm, I'm sort of a singularitarian and think we're going to hybridize with the AIs, which will expand us to much greater states of, of consciousness and work around all these silly monkey problems we have anyway. Yeah. And, and we already are hybridizing with the Internet. We're just not hardwiring it into us necessarily. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the institution that's rejecting people is not actually science. It is scientism, which is an ideology um, that anything that doesn't fit in with what I've called um, po poetical correctness, uh, political, ontological, epistemological, and theological um, received opinion at a given time and place in human history is um, bad and dangerous. A great example is um, Willem Reich himself. I mean, he died in jail because he was like imprisoned for practicing medicine without a license. And now here we are now, you know, talking about his theories and all the people who, uh, you know, developed theories of, uh, as an outgrowth of that. Um, now, what Charles Tart is talking about is um, the state specific science, and I think you, know, you are. You're getting at that, and Ben's getting at that, which is um, not limited to any given state. 
what, what, what he's saying is that science as we know it actually is state specific. It's specific to the waking state. Scientists conduct their science in the waking state. Um, the waking state scientists have now begun to study subjects, participants in other states. Um, you know, uh, Charles Tart calls them altered states of consciousness. Um, uh, discrete um, altered states of consciousness. So for example, you know, you're interested in intuition. Um, from using Tart's model, you would have um, scientists um, who are intuitive, or, you know, why, why say they have to be scientists who are intuitive? They can be people who are intuitive, who are seeking knowledge from the, from the basis of that intuition. And if they're seeking knowledge, they're scientists. We don't have to listen to, um, to the accepted definitions of what constitutes a scientist. Who cares if someone has a PhD? If you're seeking knowledge, you're a scientist. Um, and, and the ashrams, I think, are good examples of uh, people getting together and doing what Ben is talking about. And now scientists are going into the ashrams. So now you have people in these altered states, uh, state-specific um, scientists. And then you have people in other states, the waking states, with all their gadgets and neurological uh, you know, devices um, measuring people in these other states. So that, that's a real beginning yeah. of, of, of the model that Ben's getting at. I just want to tag on. Uh, actually, we are plugged into the internet. There's, uh, I'm on, I'm a, I subscribe to a mailing list, uh, Ray Kurzweil's uh, mailing list. And Magnet U is a, is a product where you, you can, that's the size of a memory stick. And you put it in your pocket and you program it, your profile. And so if there's other people have, with that in their pocket and they have a profile that matches yours, whether it's a Facebook, Twitter like profile, somehow you get an SMS like there's a person over there. So, you know, in this room would be a great example, right? We, if with this device, we would actually kind of be clued in on people in the room. It's kind of interesting. So it's not plugged in quite yet, but very close. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just okay. uh, a question for Ben. Uh, at what stage, working on AI, at what stage do you see computers evolving to a point where they will be asking these same questions, and and what form does that take? Uh, I guess the answer is supposed to be December twenty first, two thousand twelve. No, I, I mean. The timing of progress of, of artificial general intelligence is not that easy in, in, to predict. It, because it's a large, complex software project with a number of subsidiary research projects involved. I mean, Microsoft can't even predict how long it will take to, rela to release the next version of Windows. And, and there's no research involved there. I mean, my, my own gut feel is that if, if I got sufficient funding into my OpenCog AGI project, we could be there within a decade. And if funding for my own project and similar ones lags, I would go with Ray Kurzweil's prediction. He predicted human level AI in 2030. And then he predicted a, a singularity with massively superhuman AI by 2045. And the specific timing of these things really depends on funding and enthusiasm among the AI and software developer community as much as on the fundamental science. But I think the key point out of all this is it could really be like decades or conceivably even years and not, not necessarily centuries or millennia. So in, in the scope of overall human history, whether it's like one decade or five decades, it's not a very big deal. I mean, the, the point is that <laughs> The human race seems plausibly pretty close to creating machines that are massively more intelligent than us and also can explore states of consciousness going beyond the menu of states of consciousness that are accessible to, to human beings, which is it's something we're not very good at thinking about yet, since we, we don't even have a decent science of the states of consciousness that we habitually occupy each day as we go about our lives, let alone being able to think about the states of consciousness achievable by massively superhuman minds. Yeah, another thought on that is you're asking when will artificial intelligence be able to pose the questions we're posing? Well, right now, 
because why are we distinguishing between ourselves and artificial intelligence? <laughs> These questions were not being posed 200, 300, 1,000, 10,000, 40,000 years ago necessarily, although you will see it in, I mean, the Upanishads kind of talk about this stuff already, about years ago. But, um, you know, we, we are continuously evolving ourselves, right? We are continuously programming ourselves. And maybe December 21st, 2012, you know, it won't be artificial brains that are doing it. It'll be our own brains because there will be this just amazingly rapid increase in our evolution toward what we're actually capable of and what the yogis have been telling us we are or we are capable of. We just don't know it because we haven't been taught to practice the techniques that we would need to practice to do it because we're more interested in seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. But the people who have been more interested in realizing their full consciousness potential and have been willing to renounce um, pleasure and not care about pain so much. I mean, Romana's feet were full of splinters. He used to feed the lice on his couch. He would feed the lice. He, he eventually died of cancer. Might be because his disciples, um, not disciples, he had no disciples, his devotees um, sprayed his couch with DDT to kill the lice. They tricked him. He went out, they sprayed with DDT. No more lice, uh, no more Ramana Maharshi a couple years later. Huh? You know, think about that. All right, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, the day will come when the AI for the first time asks, who am I? That is the threshold. Yeah. <laughs> okay, just a moment. So this, this question is mostly directed at Dr. Green. Um, I was hearing earlier that um, the, the talk about how there are scientists in ashrams now, and it raised the question for me, um, so to what extent is this study in consciousness um, available to be decoded by science, and where is the line end where if scientists will then need to go in and explore it through their own experiences and through their own sort of travels in consciousness? Pretty nuanced question, actually. There's a lot of places to go. So that was actually to me, uh, even though I didn't, I didn't mention the ashram. Oh, oh I know, I, but I okay. talked about the mind body. Well, you know, I, I, that little exercise which I went through very quickly at the very end was really an invitation for everyone to, to connect. I mean, I, it's, it's fascinating to follow these two presentations because they really set me up really well. I mean, Doug's idea of uh, we are all scientists, uh, if we choose to be, as far as exploring states. Um, you know, setting examples of being connected with our bodies, for example, um, to our family members and other people around us, and, and I'm not talking about just doing aerobic exercises, but being connected with our bodies in, in a way that is uh, listening to our bodies and developing ways to um, kind of spread that body consciousness idea, I, I think, is, is helpful to society at large. I don't really have a, an answer regarding, you know, setting up uh, an enclave or an ashram or something like that. But I think public awareness and education is really, and even Hong Kong is getting on board with the three H's, happiness, harmony, I can't remember the other one, but this idea of promoting subjective well-being amongst people, uh, people can have better lives if they pay attention. And one of the, I think one important domain is the body, obviously, uh, not just to medicate it, but to listen to it. I'm not sure if I answered your I mean, in terms of like the experiments, saying like Lynn of Haggard's book, The Intention Experiment, right. to what extent the science, can science, li is science limited in terms of proving, you know, consciousness or? I, I, know it is. I, I think it's a matter of, it's just a matter of time. I mean, for some of the reasons that um, Ben and Doug pointed out, I mean, we, we have, the scientific method uh, can really trap us when, when we're looking at subjectivity. Right, so who is doing the who is doing the questioning? Who is doing the researching? Um, very difficult to get a third person point of view on someone else's consciousness. Right. Um, so it's uh, I think it's a quantum. We're just not quite there yet, and and we just really haven't discovered uh, I don't know some kind of general principle that connects uh, matter with with mind or the mind that's in matter, so to speak, 
Um, but we're certainly pushing hard, I think, in that direction. I'm not sure how that relates to AI. Um, but well, yeah, I, I think that science, as currently constituted, cannot address subjective experience directly, though it can find empirical patterns in physical systems that correlate with verbal reports of subjective experience. But that's, that's not quite the same thing as grappling with subjective experience directly. But that's not to say that some other discipline, which is a descendant of the current scientific method, might not grapple with subjective experience directly. And my feeling is that AI could play a large role in developing some kind of descendant of current science which can deal better with subjective experience, mainly because AIs can be manipulated and can manipulate themselves in ways that, that we can't. I mean, if, if, if you could kind of twiddle with your brain however you felt like and see what effect it had on your consciousness, and we could all do that together. That just seems like it could push in some interesting new directions for discovery, even though we can't figure out exactly what those are at, at the present point in time. Um, and, and this is being done, actually. Um, if you look at the Monroe Institute in Virginia, um, you know, Bob Monroe, he was a, uh, I guess, a communications guy who wired up Virginia with cable. Um, but he started realizing one day that he could leave his body, and then he developed this hemisync technology, listening to binaural beats to synchronize the brain. And, you know, now you can go there and they will put you in these, you know, chambers and you'll be listening to binaural beats of various frequencies that manipulate the brain in very systematic ways and have very predictable effects. Um, and people report leaving the body and having experiences, not only individual, but verifiable communal experiences with other people. There's also Waldo Vieira. Um, he's a, I'm not sure if he's a psychiatrist out of Brazil, but he also has a laboratory in Brazil and a laboratory in Portugal. And again, it, it relates to uh, leaving the body. Um, so Vieira, Monroe, um, you know, these are, um, these are scientists um, conducting scientific experiments with all the bells and whistles you would associate with, with science in terms of looking at the brain and manipulating the brain and... Uh, not to mention near-death experience. Not to mention, yeah, not to mention near-death experience research. Yeah. All right, we can continue, I'm sure, but... Um, yeah, I think defining science and considering what science is is a lot of what we're looking at today here, just like defining consciousness and understanding what consciousness is. So with this panel and these group of speakers, we're really looking at just some very alternative perspectives of consciousness being limited or not limited by the body, um, of what science is, and, and considering these alternative perspectives of science. Um, in our next block, we're going to have um, the science of traditions being represented. Um, Buddhism, Qigong, and yoga. And in the final block, we'll be looking a little more at empirical science, especially our keynote will be speaking specifically from empirical science. And he is studying consciousness um, as much as possible from a very empirical, methodological viewpoint. And it's great, I think, to have these conversations happening from many different perspectives and questioning what is science and what is important in this topic that we have a hard time a hard time defining. So thank you so much to our panel and for you all. Give them a hand. <laughs> yeah, we'll take